Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming out uh, this afternoon. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about uh, podcasting, benefits for teaching and learning. Uh, how many of you feel that they, they know a lot about the University of the Sciences? Uh, I see maybe two hands. Well, what I'll do is um, see if I can get this. Uh... From the beginning, it's been about discovery, inspiring students to seek, to learn, to innovate. Their curiosity, their love of science, and their passion to discover has helped us grow into a major university. Just as we've evolved, so has our identity. In the 12 short years since we became University of the Sciences in Philadelphia, we've already outgrown the name. Our history and heritage, our unique DNA remain the same, but now it's been transformed into a name and logo that expresses our growth, our broader reach, and our potential for the future. Presenting U Sciences, University of the Sciences, and the growing family of colleges within it. With this dramatic transformation, we are not just showing a new face to the world, we are inviting the world to discover a dynamic new presence, a place where healthcare and science converge. I don't know, I, I, I always uh, feel that I have to uh, say who we are. Some people confuse us with Philadelphia University, which is the textile school, and we're the former uh, Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. So uh, we've certainly expanded things. So uh, besides our marketing department, spent a fortune on that video, and I feel I should give them their, 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 their due. So uh, again, I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, you, you pretty much know uh, about us. Uh, found it way back in 1821 as College of Pharmacy. We're sort of tucked in behind the University of Pennsylvania um, on Woodland Avenue, 2,600, actually more than that now, undergraduate students. So uh, today, uh, my objectives is to tell you a little bit about podcasting, some of the history, which I think is kind of interesting, uh, and then how to do it yourself, um, how to create, publish, and distribute your own podcasts, and what some of the benefits are of uh, podcasting for teaching and learning, and, and how to find some more information. So first, a little bit of background. Um, you still hear the term uh, Web 2.0. Now they're talking about Web 3.0. I'm not sure exactly what that is yet. But um, Web 2.0 is basically meaning that you can participate easily on the web. Um, all the social media, this is all part and parcel of Web 2.0, so I don't think I need to, uh, to dwell on that. So I've heard podcasting described as sort of like TiVo for radio. Some people don't know what TiVo is, but it's a way to uh, download a basically an internet radio program you download it and you play it at your leisure so it's, you can time shift and place shift uh, those programs. Uh, it's a very fast growing Web 2.0 technology, even faster than DVDs grew. So uh, now this came out right around the time that iPods came out. So you don't need an iPod. You know, that the, the term I guess came from, from pod, uh, podcasting came from the, the invention of the iPod. Um, in fact, somebody even wrote a little song about it. I don't know if you caught that, but a lot of people listen on the desktop, so you don't really need a portable device anymore. You can listen to these on the desktop, but that's sort of like streaming, and we're all familiar with now with streaming audio and video from, from a web browser. Of course, you can do that with, with most uh, iPods. Now, I have some questions for you. So if we want to make this a little bit of inter interactive, I know it's not a big crowd, but if you have a smartphone with you, uh, you could take it out now and go to this website, polev.com slash kinetics. Um, kinetics is, uh, pharmacokinetics is a topic I teach when I, when I do teach. So uh, I reserve that name. So if you want to take a moment and um, get out your, your smartphone and bring up your web browser and go to polev.com kinetics. So here's my first question. This should, if everything is, if the inter internet gods are working here, this should come up in a moment. Your first question, please. No, tell, don't tell me, it's gonna make a liar out of me. Maybe I forgot to get back into here when I, um, no, it, should be, it should be ready. Oh, I know what, I forgot a step. 
Very important. Okay. And let me go back. Here we go. So you can actually also do it, uh, answer this uh, even with a text, uh, even if you just have uh, a text capability. So uh, the first question is, what kind of phone do you have with you today? An iPhone, Android phone, Windows phone, or a dumb phone, a feature phone? And I see some of you are responding already. Um, so, and you should see the results there. So we've got about 67% uh, of you have an iPhone, not surprising, and the rest pretty much have um, uh, Android phones. Again, it's poll, if you're, if you're still not on, and go to poll pollev.com slash kinetics, or you can just text that one of those five, one of those four numbers to the short code 37607. All right, that's my first question. Um, second question is, are you familiar with the term podcasting before today? Now, it doesn't tell me how many are answering, so that could be all of you. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't have devices, how many of you um, were not really familiar with the term podcasting? Okay, so there are a couple of you. Okay. So uh, my next question is, um, have you ever listened to an audio podcast? Okay, I see some... Uh, Head shaking and downward thumbs there. So we have some that, that have, and um, maybe the ones that haven't don't have their phone. So <laughs> we won't dwell in here. This is great for a big audience, by the way. Uh, for a small audience, this makes so much difference. For a large audience, would it be like 95%? Um, Podcasts are more than 50%. Oh, I bet, uh, in fact, I'll probably show you some st statistics later. It's probably about 40 to 50% of people have listened to podcasts. So uh, in the last month, have you listened to an audio podcast, viewed a video podcast? Now, I'm not going to be talking about video podcasting. That's uh, an order of magnitude more difficult to, to do, and I've done them, but um, we're going to start just with uh, audio podcasting today. And, and uh, so we have a few who have listened to audio podcasts, and some have viewed a uh, video podcast. And uh, now if you've listened to a podcast, how do you listen? You can click on a link in a website to play the podcast. A lot of people do that. Or you can subscribe in iTunes and download it uh, to your device. Uh, or you can subscribe now to podcasts uh, using an app right on your phone. So um, it used to be that when I listened to podcasts, uh, I would uh, subscribe on my Mac or my PC at home and then leave my... Um, my iPhone or my whatever phone I had at the time, even, even before that, an iPod, and plug it into my computer. And by the next morning, it would have downloaded the podcast and transferred them to my device. Now you can go in an app and directly, and you don't have to do that on your desktop computer. You can download and play the uh, podcast directly from your, your device. Okay, so uh, some of you have done, clicked on a website and, and used uh, iTunes. And I think this is the last question. Oh, yeah. If you do have a podcast, what is your favorite podcast? So here you just type in the title as much as you can remember of your podcast. And you should probably use underscore because it's going to take them all as separate words, I think. So uh, let's, let's see if uh, some of you can remember some of your favorite podcasts. I, I know what I listen to a lot are, are NPR. I, you know, when I'm traveling, especially in the car, I listen to National Public Radio. Some of their programs. Um, um, hey, <laughs> there's a fan. Rod's Pulse podcast, good enough. All right, I'll move on. So a little bit about uh, podcasting history, which um, I think is pretty interesting. Um, as I'll explain in a moment, it's really uh, was enabled by uh, the marriage of an MP3, which is an audio format of, for music, and RSS, which stands for Real Simple Syndication. We'll get into that. But Adam Curry, how many of you remember Adam Curry from uh, MTV, early MTV video DJ days? Anybody out there? Okay, all right. So uh, Adam Curry was a, 
video disc jockey. Um, and he was very tech savvy and very much an entrepreneur. And that's, uh, that picture, that's the way he looked uh, back in the MTV days. And then he came out um, with a, the first podcast that I listened to on a regular basis called The Daily Source Code. And if those of you who are into computers, you know source code is computer code. And he did this every day. He, he brought, and sometimes they were an hour or two hours long. And he used this as a way to sort of crowdsource and get other like-minded techies interested in this field and actually started to develop software using crowdsourcing. He developed uh, his uh, daily source code website, uh, www.curry.com. Uh, he worked with some people to develop a what we'll call a podcatcher. This is before iTunes got into the, into the swing of things here. It sort of took over. Um, they developed Podshow, the Podsafe Music Network. I'll show you a screenshot from that. And that's where I get my music, because sometimes I play uh, you know, royalty-free uh, music that people that are trying to promote their bands, they want to put out there for people to use to attract attention. So there's, there are a number of different sources you can go to if you want to play music on your podcast. Not that you're going to do that for, with your students necessarily, unless you're, uh, unless you're uh, teaching music. Uh, but for a podcast, uh, for a lot of podcasts, it's, it's, a, it's a diversion. It's just a little uh, item of interest. So, Daily Source Code came out in 2004. And the way I discovered this was, at the time I was commuting, I, I was at Thomas Jefferson University for 20 years. Uh, and I used to commute on the, on the L. And um, I was tired of listening to my same music over and over again on my CD player. You know, you could put MP3s on a CD player. So, I, and I also like to listen to NPR, so I thought there must be a way to record radio shows and save them. So I did a Google search and I ran across this phenomenon called, phenomenon called podcasting. So, and that's, and his name came up. I mean, he, uh, like I show here, is the, the pod father. So um, I listened to him for a number of years. That was started in 2004 and I started my own podcast in 2006. So, um, like I said, he's very, very, very much an entrepreneur. In fact, he worked at MTV and he reserved the domain name MTV.com without getting MTV's permission. And so you can imagine uh, the fun that ensued after that. And he was uh, forced to to give that up to uh, MTV. But he's developed he he developed a very successful company before the dot com crash and sold it. So he's quite the entrepreneur. Uh, in in doing some research on him, I found this. Uh, interesting video. I recognize Steve Jobs, the D3 well, conference. You could, you could try to sell podcasts, but the whole phenomenon is so great, it's free. And I think what we're going to see is an advertising supported model emerge just like free radio. Here's another, Adam Curry is uh, one of the guys that invented podcasting. And uh, he has a podcast called The Daily Source. Let me go ahead and subscribe to that. Daily Source Code. And uh, we can go listen to his latest one. And just click on it. Code, show number 180. Something remarkable is happening here. Radio is springing free of the regulated gatekeepers who've managed what you can hear since radio was invented. It's jumping into the hands of anyone at all with something or nothing to say. Uh, $16 million worth of airplane strapped to my ass. Mm -hmm. To the next generation radio content in my ears. Right, it's show number 180, and it's Friday, everybody. Thank God. I've actually had to restart the show three times. My Mac has been acting up like a motherfucker. I think it's a little embarrassing for Steve Jobs <laughs> in front of the whole audience. So that's, uh, that's Adam Curry. He contributed quite a lot. Okay, let's move on. Where is it? Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, RSS 2.0 is what makes podcasting work. Now, RSS, really simple syndication, has been around for a while. RSS 1 is what enabled blogs. Everybody 
probably has read a blog or at least knows what they are these days. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you subscribe to a blog, um, you could do that way back when using uh, RSS 1.0. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, all RSS 2.0 did, and, and Adam Curry was involved with some of the uh, uh, designers that, that worked on this uh, uh, technology. All that does is add a, a way to add an, an enclosure, a link to another file. So rather than just getting text, there's a link to a music file, a link to a video, and so forth. So that's what RSS does, and that's what really enabled um, uh, podcasting. So podcasting is, is everywhere. Uh, ex who's doing it? Experienced bloggers. I guess uh, I come under the uh, uh, tech-savvy uh, amateur uh, part of this. And, and some of the uh, National Public Radio was a very, um, you know, one of, the, one of the early adopters of podcasting. So a lot of their shows that you might listen to are available as separate podcasts on NPR. Um, I no longer, the daily source code is gone. Um, Adam Curry, uh, has other ventures. He does have a, 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 a podcast called No Agenda, but uh, the one that I listen to uh, all the time, uh, weekly, is This Week in Tech. Uh, Leo Laporte has been around for a long time, so that's, that's one that I listen to a lot. And certainly educational institutions have a lot of uh, podcasts out there. Podcast is growing. Um, if you can imagine, there's over 91,000 podcasts in a, a directory that uh, Podcast Alley keeps. And Apple has really taken over. There are other technologies you can use to find and listen to podcasts, but really uh, Apple with iTunes uh, is the way to go in terms of promoting your podcasts and listening to podcasts. So uh, they have over one billion, one billion with a B, podcast subscribers in iTunes. So people from all over the world are subscribing to uh, podcasts that way. So. Uh, Podcast is catching on. You can see some growth uh, statistics there. So how do you podcast? And let's get into some of the, uh, the do's. This is a concept map, which um, sort of shows how you can, um, here you are, the podcaster, and you have to, you record your, your podcast audio file here, and you write your blog. Now, you, you have to have something to go along with the podcast, because you have to tell people what's in the podcast and you might describe it and so on, and you have to lead people to it. So, uh, and I'll go through, I'll take this in a little more depth in a moment. Ba basically, you, you have to store the audio file someplace, you store the web page for your blog someplace, and then you create what's called an RSS feed, which, will, which I've mentioned, and then here's your audience uh, hooked into iTunes, and this is how they can subscribe. They can actually listen to it directly in iTunes, or they can download it onto their, I should have a smartphone here now, this is an older graphic. I have an iPod and a PDA, remember them? A PDA and MP3 players. So that's just a quick um, concept map of how all this works. So for the producer, you have to record an audio file in MP3 format. You upload the MP3 in the show notes to a web server. Uh, then you create an RSS feed and submit to, op uh, I shouldn't say optional anymore, it's really mandatory these days. And for the listener, I've already really described um, how you go about listening to, to some of these podcasts. So it requires hardware and software. Uh, obviously you need a, a PC or a Mac. You need a microphone, and it's important to have a decent microphone. I don't know if you've ever listened to some poor audio recordings, but it's very hard on the ears after some time, and I'll, I'll give you a little demonstration of that. Uh, and then you have to have hardware. You have to, you know, you have to um, host those files somewhere, and we'll talk about that. And, of course, the software, the editing software that goes along with all this. So first you create your podcast, and then we'll talk about publishing and distributing it. So how do you uh, create your podcast? Well, the first thing to do is buy a good quality microphone. Now, you're not going to want to use the mic that's built into your laptop as much as you paid for that laptop. Uh, you probably owe it to yourself. You're going to do this with any regularity to, to get a decent uh, microphone. So you want to look for a um, condenser microphone. There's different types of mics. Um, uh, they tend to be a little bit more expensive than the, than the um, dynamic microphones, which you could get at Radio Shack for $10. You want to spend a little more on a condenser microphone. Um, look for a USB 
microphone, which allows you to connect it to your PC or, or Mac. And there are also battery-operated uh, remote phone recorders available. Um, and right from your iPhone, your Android phone, they all have recording apps these days. However, the quality of the microphone is not very good. So unless you're going to attach an external mic to that, you're probably not going to want to use that as your main source of recording. You could in a pinch, maybe if you're, if you're uh, traveling or you're at a trade show and you're interviewing somebody, uh, you could use that. Um, but uh, again, have a good quality uh, mic. Uh, and I just show you, uh, just to give you a start, if you're looking for a, uh, a mic, now I don't have a blue mic, but that company uh, is very popular. A lot of podcasters swear by their mics. They have a couple different brands, a couple different styles. This one is, uh, you know, $45, $46. Um, the one that I have is a, uh, a Samsung, not, not the Samsung, but Samsung. Uh, microphone. And it comes actually in a podcast package, which is very reasonable. I, I think at the time I paid closer to $200 for it, but it comes with a, a, a microphone, a condenser mic, USB condenser mic, a stand, and um, one of these uh, sort of isolation, isolation rigs here so that the microphone is sort of floating and you don't get any uh, vibration through your desktop or if you're using your mouse while you're talking you don't hear that. I, I went to all kinds of trouble to try to find a quiet spot in my house and uh, if I podcast it, if I record my podcast at work I usually wait till after five and things have calmed down a little bit because you don't want distraction. Although these condenser microphones are pretty um, focused so it's not going to pick up a lot of background noise. You have to get within maybe six to eight inches of, of the mic. But anyway you want to make uh, uh, good quality recording. Can you go back to the cost of that? Just so we can see it. Sure. Uh, 129. Thank 129. You. Yep. Um, now I have a, um, a sample from my very first podcast in 2006 and compared that, that here I'll play that first. This is my first podcast as mentioned and uh, we'll be doing some testing you know, along the way and my our goal is to podcast while I am in San Diego at the upcoming Blackboard conference. Blackboard, as you know, is the software behind Pulse. And um, if you are a Pulse user, faculty person running a course or an organization manager, then you may be interested in seeing how you can enhance your content uh, by adding your own podcast. So you mentioned the word, uh, I mentioned the word Pulse. Uh, that's how I got my name because Pulse was the Jefferson's, the name for Jefferson's Blackboard site. So uh, I called mine the Pulse Podcast and it was really designed initially, my podcast was on podcasting. It was helping to, to show our faculty how they could use podcasts to, to enhance their teaching and learning. So hence the name which uh, sort of stuck. Um, so that was, now you can, you can probably hear this, you know, the high frequencies, this, you know, a lot of, uh, now here, compare what I just played to this one. Today I have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Kenneth Hartman, who's formerly the president a lot deeper, of you don't get the hissing. University Online, or Drexel E-Learning, if you will, and currently a senior fellow at Edu Ventures. He has a tremendous amount of experience. All right, in so that's what a good, uh, good quality microphone does. Um, now you're going to need an editor. You're going to need to edit that. And um, uh, there are other editors out there. Uh, I'm most familiar with both of these. I think I would, I would bet the majority of um, audio people, uh, period, are going to use uh, Audacity, for example, is strictly audio waveform editing. And it's free. Uh, if you just Google Audacity, you'll go to the website where you can download it. Um, GarageBand is excellent also. In fact, this has some, a lot of additional features. I actually use both of them. When I'm editing the audio file to begin with, I use Audacity. And this is how I take out the ums and the ahs. I use a lot of ums. I probably use them today. <laughs> so I can actually identify what an um looks like on the waveform. I almost don't need to hear it. And I can go through and I can edit out my ums and my ahs and make it sound a little bit closer to what you would find on NPR. In fact, uh, I wish I could, uh, could find it, but NPR did an excellent uh, program, I guess it was a couple years ago now, and they talked about 
the editing that goes into editing one of their NPR programs, the audio editing, and it's absolutely amazing. I mean, they make the people sound really smart. They never hesitate. They never go back. They never, blah, you know, and it's all in the editing, the post-processing. So I try to do that. Um, I've, had, I've had some interviews where I've had people that, you know, really, uh, 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 you know, uh, stutter, hesitate, um and ah, uh, and I try to take all of that out if I can. So, you know, my typical podcast is about maybe 15 minutes, uh, 20 minutes at the most in terms of the raw aud of the final audio. But it'll take me, I would say, maybe three, four hours of work and editing down the the uh, podcast uh, to get to make it sound a little bit better. So here's a screenshot from. Uh, Audacity, and you can see what the waveform looks like, a stereo waveform here. And it's just a matter of cutting and, you know, highlighting, you know, selecting and cutting. So you can, long pauses you can cut out, uh, you can get rid of the ums and the ahs and so on. So I just use that for the, the raw editing. And uh, you can change the volume, you can normalize the volume, there's a number of things you can do. Very sophisticated uh, free editing program. Then once I get all my pieces together, I, I use um, uh, GarageBand. Now GarageBand, uh, if you're a musician and you do your own recordings, this, I mean, it has amazing capabilities. You can record, you know, multiple tracks. So uh, you can see each of these bands at the top are different tracks. Um, so all those little uh, RNG boxes are each a different audio file. And uh, I, have, I have like an introduction, I have a, an intro and an outro, and I have music. And so you place those different audio files in GarageBand, and then that creates, mushes everything together and creates the final uh, MP3 file that is the podcast. So um, uh, GarageBand, I think with new Macs, is free, right? Uh, with the new iLife, uh, when you buy a new Mac, uh, starting to, I guess, November. Um, you get iLife, which is all the apps. I mean, my, I mean, Apple is really uh, sticking it to Microsoft. They're essentially giving away all their software, all their uh, pretty good software. So uh, GarageBand, even even at that, I think it's uh, GarageBand is twenty nine dollars on a on a Mac or a PC. It's both. It's cross platform, um, and um, it's even cheaper on an iPad. Yeah. I, I, I use uh, Audacity, I should have mentioned, I use Audacity to record, yep, yep, so my, my it's a good point, I didn't say that, my uh, USB mic plugged into Audacity running and that's recording the, the recording. Um, however, when I'm doing, I didn't even mention this, but when I'm doing an interview, oftentimes that is not face to face, it's over the phone, so what I'll, uh, well not really over the phone, I'll use Skype. Uh, so I'll do a, a Skype recording and there's, there's if Probably many of you have Skype. Many of you use uh, Skype, okay? So quite a few of you use Skype, and you can get a um, a recording module that goes along with Skype uh, that you can record the telephone conversation. And it's better than telephone. I've tried in the past recording actually directly from a landline telephone, and it's lousy. <laughs> um, so you always want to make sure the person on the other end is not on a cell phone, <laughs> not on not on um, you know, a noisy line. A landline is okay, but if they can get onto their computer and have Skype to Skype, because I can call a landline phone from my Skype account, but it's better if they're also on Skype. It gets the, you get the best uh, audio quality. So I would say these days about three quarters of my podcasts are involved in interview, uh, mostly using Skype. So there we go. Thanks for the question. Uh, there's a screenshot from GarageBand. <coughs> so once you have your recording done, you have your final. I just uh, about sure. Is, what about your environment? Like, you said you find a quiet room. Is it, do you have to worry about echoes and you know, all that sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, very good question. Um, it's better if you have some sound absorbing material. Um, if you're in a bare room, you do get that sort of auditorium, that echoey sound, and it's not very good. You can modify that to some extent in GarageBand. There's some filters that you can apply that. You can give it different ambiance, but it's best if you have some, hang some drapes or uh, serious podcasters, you know, put the sound absorbing foam all around the room. 
Uh, I even, uh, for when I was doing this at home, I even invested in a, almost like a shield that would go around the mic, like right here. It was, it was like a parabolic shield that had sound absorbing material in it so that when I was speaking into it, you don't get the echoes. Good, good question, yeah. Um, so now you want to publish your podcast. And there are different, first you have to publish the audio file. You have to find some place to host it. Now, um, there are a number of commercial companies that allow you to host, and some of them are free. Um, and then Blackboard. I mean, you're, I think you're a Blackboard school. So um, if you're using it as a podcast, uh, you're not necessarily streaming it. So it's not too bad. Audio files tend to be fairly small. You could actually host the audio file uh, on Blackboard. More likely, in a university setting, you might use a lecture capture system. And I know I'll be talking about that a little more, where the lecture capture system itself hosts the audio file and allows students to subscribe using RSS to using iTunes. You don't, just because you're using iTunes doesn't mean you're limited to the um, podcast that, uh, that put their podcast on iTunes. You can put a URL. So if I have a university um, uh, RSS feed, I can put that URL into my personal copy of iTunes and that will download those audios. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to contract with Apple to do anything like that. So you can easily add an RSS feed to, um, to iTunes. Um, I've been involved with the web for years, so I have my own, uh, my own website, so I host my own um, uh, audio files. But here's an example of um, uh, one that says free podcast hosting. I can't vouch for them. It's podbean.com. Usually what happens is they add ads. They will add what are called pre-roll or uh, ads, so uh, they have to make money somehow, so they're going to make money on your effort. Um, so I can't necessarily um, say that this is a great way to do it, but uh, that's an option. <clears throat> Another one I've heard of, and it's been around for a long time, is Libsyn. And uh, if you do a handful of podcasts like me, I mean, I do one a month. Uh, I don't have millions of people <laughs> listening to them. I wish I did. But if you are very popular, then the bandwidth that is used when people download your podcast can get very expensive. And so you're going to have to find a way to, to manage that, either find a sponsor. Libsyn is one that handles it pretty well. What they do is they, uh, it's only $5 per month, and older podcasts that are not, don't get a lot of traffic, they sort of push back on secondary servers and they keep the recent ones uh, ready to for people to download so they're they've been in this business for quite some time so that would probably be the first choice <coughs> excuse me um, if i was going to uh, to use a, a service like that so this is just to host the audio file so then you have to publish your show notes as i mentioned this would be the uh, web page that's describing uh, your podcast and uh, you might have links, uh, things you talk about. Uh, so I always have links in my show notes about what the things I'm talking about. Um, and I've used Blogger for years. Um, Blogger was a company that Google bought, I forget when, um, but it's a, f a free site where you can host a blog. And it has uh, little widgets there that, that and I can show you a little bit of a uh, screenshot of that at least, of how you give them your audio file. Um, WordPress is another one, and, and there are others. <clears throat> Here, for example, this is a, a screenshot of when I'm editing my own podcast uh, show notes. So this was the last one I did, um, and it's a simple uh, text editor, and maybe hard to see here, but there's links down here where you, you put a link on the title so that this links this URL that I'm pointing to here links to the MP3 file that I host on my own server. That could be Libsyn or one of these other services. So, um, and then you, um, you post that. And this is what, what it looks like. And if we have time, if you're interested, we can actually go to the live website. Although uh, right now I'm running on my little uh, MiFi here, so the bandwidth is, uh, is not great. Um, so, uh, and I don't know if you can see it here, but I also put a, some code in here 
um, that allows people to play it right from uh, the page. And so a lot of people will just click that link. If they don't subscribe, they can play it one off, you know, right from the web page. So now we've, uh, we've created the content, we've published the uh, MP3 and the blog, but then how do you distribute it? And this is where you'll see this symbol come up a lot, that orange square, that's sort of the, and you see this on websites, you'll, you'll note that that is a link to an RSS feed. It's, it's a, uh, a URL that you can use to subscribe to, uh, not just a podcast, you can subscribe to all kinds of blogs and so on. So, then you have, so you have to create your, your feed. And um, most people, again, use another Google company. Google bought uh, FeedBurner. Um, so now that's a Google company. It's the largest uh, uh, provider of um, RSS feeds. And uh, that's where I got that uh, graph from. So you would log in, now that's owned by Google. If you have a Gmail account, you can log in, you can create your own feeds, it's all free. And you get a stats page like this. And you can see right here, this is my, my, the title of my uh, feed, Rod's Pulse Podcast. And this is the uh, URL that goes to the, to the post that I have on Blogger. Okay? So the post I have on Blogger has the link to my MP3 file. Okay? So it's a little hard to keep that straight. And that generates the actual feed address, <coughs> feeds, uh, feeder, feedburner.com, Rod's Pulse Podcast, and you can uh, call that whatever you wish. So <clears throat> then when people go to my website, they go to my blog, they can click that orange button and they get the URL that they can put into iTunes if they want to subscribe. Or you can go to iTunes directly and look for it there because I've registered my podcast with iTunes. But I want to bring this uh, out. You can also subscribe via email. So, um, FeedBurner provides this little widget that I put on my website, I put on my blog, and uh, so I have people that just enter their email address, so every time I do a, an episode, they get an email saying, you know, there's a new uh, podcast out to, to listen to. By the way, just a point of interest, the blogger that Google bought, the people that found a blogger uh, went off to found Twitter. So they, they, those guys have been around for a while and they're making tons of money. <laughs> In fact, Twitter's going public, right? Twitter, I think, is going public. The, the founder is going to be worth a billion dollars. I know I went to the wrong field. Um, so, so then you have to promote your podcast. And again, the, the single best thing to do is to register your podcast with the uh, iTunes Music Store. Again, this is depending what your audience is, of course. And then you can go in and you can go to these other podcast directories. I'll tell you, they're probably not as important these days. Um, as long as you have your uh, podcast in iTunes. And then there are various uh, other promotional tools. Uh, well, here's a screenshot from uh, podcastdirectory.com. Um, it's one of the, so iTunes has the, or Apple has the right to not accept your podcast. So if it's too racy, uh, something that they don't feel uh, is in keeping with their, um, quality, uh, they will reject it. So you can find all kinds of crazy podcasts on these other podcast directories. Uh, podcastdirectory.com, here's one called Podcast Alley. And uh, this is uh, Music Alley. Now this is a, um, uh, a spin-off of the company, one of the companies that Adam Curry uh, produced. And this is where uh, bands go and, and put their music out there. So you can you actually use them to host your podcast, to host your show but it's also a source for finding music that you might want to use on your podcast. And, and a lot of my music, most of it comes from uh, Music Alley. They're mostly unsigned bands, but <clears throat> uh, if, in case you, you don't know how you know, the music industry works, um, the, the music labels get the bulk of the, of the money. The, the, the artist uh, benefits most personally when they do uh, live concerts. They usually retain the rights to live concerts. So some of the music on here maybe known bands, maybe ones that are probably uh, been around for too long and they're still singing and, and they'll post their, uh, uh, their music out here for you to use. Um, so I've, I've used some of their, their music as well. Uh, this is another one called podfeed.net. And um, 
you can see there, this is, this is something that, um, you see they have a link to my recent podcast out here. So once you put your podcast out there and you have a feed, it's a way to syndicate it. So, and there's no money changing hands there, they're not paying me. They could just go out and, and uh, scan the web and they pull out podcasts and they add it to their directory. Actually, at some point, I may have added it. I can't remember anymore. But um, because they have my feed, they will, this, this content here is the text. So it's, they're reformatting what's on my blogger page because all that content is in FeedBurner. So once they have that feed, they can pull out the text and the links to, to my audio files. And that's another way you can promote things, I guess. Um, so, uh, then how do you uh, listen to podcasts? Uh, we've covered some of this. Um, so you can listen directly from a website and so on. We used to call them podcatchers. There were a number of them. Juice is one, but again, iTunes is really the, the way to go these days. Uh, Yahoo had a website called podcast.yahoo.com. I tried to get to it, but it's gone. It's no longer there. So I think uh, iTunes is the way to go. Uh, and here's a list of some of the podcatcher platforms. Um, this is just a screen, in case you haven't, uh, if, if you don't use iTunes regularly, and you may not realize that you can click on the link up here that goes to podcast, so, and there's subcategories. So these are links to educational podcasts of all kinds of topics. And um, I think mine's listed under a subcategory of education training. Um, but if you do a search for Rod's Pulse podcast, you'll, you'll find it. Uh, on the iTunes store and then you can just hit the subscribe button. So once you subscribe to it, um, then you'll see that it's in iTunes under your podcast list. So th these, you know, this is where your personal music is, your personal movies and TV shows, and here are all the podcasts you're subscribing to. So you can see uh, the things that I subscribe to here, uh, NPR Car Talk and uh, um, on, the, on the radio by NPR and so on. So, and you get a list and it it downloads automatically the, the latest uh, podcast for you to play. But like I said, I don't connect my iPhone to iTunes anymore. I, I do it directly from my, my cell phone. So um, uh, podcasts, as you notice in iTunes, is listed right alongside music. Um, there's the music, um, uh, what do you call it, the, um, uh, on your, on your uh, cell phone. Um, there's music, but Apple recently separated out podcasts, so it has its own app now that's separate from the music. So here's a link to it here. If you, if you Google uh, podcast by Apple, you'll see a link to it, and this is what it looks like. If you search for it on the iTunes store, you can search for podcasts, and you can download. This is a free app, uh, and you can download it onto your, on your portable device. So here's what it looks like uh, on the new iOS. Um, here are all my music. Uh, apps, and here's podcasts, it shows that there are 17 podcasts I haven't listened to yet. Uh, and you click on that, and here you can see the ones I'm subscribing to. Uh, that's Adam Curry, that's his new podcast called No Agenda. And, um, and then when you click on uh, the podcast like I did here, you'll, you'll uh, see mine. And just to give you a little flavor of uh, my particular format, I'll play a little bit of it. You are listening to The Pulse, Rod Murray's e-learning tech podcast, number <coughs> 112. I'm not going to, I'm sort of running low on time, so I'm not going to pl play it all, but I'll let, leave that up to you because I know we're, it's getting a little bit late here. Um, I wanted to jump into some of the benefits for, for teaching and learning. Before, well, before I get onto that, just to back up a bit, my format is I give a little teaser of music, I introduce the topic for the day, for the episode, and then I have the interview usually or, or the full topic. And then at the end of the podcast, I play the full song. And I figure if, if somebody's listened, subscribed and they're listening into my, into their, in their car and they don't care about the topic, they can just skip and, uh, and, and listen to the music instead. So that, that's my particular format. So what are some of the benefits for teaching and learning? This I thought was an uh, interesting video I just found on USA Today. Hey guys. YouTube Shane Dawson is the latest to add podcasters to his resume. You are listening on video, but 
But the ones who do can become intensely loyal fans as the podcasters we met up with hope. I never had an answer to that question before when people go, what's your favorite thing to do? Stand up, acting, TV, movies. I was like, well, this is better because of this and this podcast is the best because it's so personal. And people interact with podcasts in such a specific way, even more than with uh, with video, because they they listen to it in their car, they listen to it through, through headphones. It's very intimate. It's just your voice and your guest voice kind of, you know, and they're the third person in this conversation. So I think that there's a, an informality and an intimacy that people develop with you when they listen to your podcast. This, I really didn't even know what the pod part was of the podcast for the first two and a half years. There's no long form conversation. You can go on YouTube and see Dick Havoc in the 70s and talk to John Lennon for 90 minutes, and it's incredible. So I just imagine let's do that. So I'm averaging now about two hours. John Landis still holding his record at two hours and 52 minutes. He's a talker. You know, I, I do love just not having to worry about what you're wearing and, and not having to worry about uh, what camera you're looking at. And you've been saying much more than you can never say on television. I have a new bunch of people that are, are, are fans of mine. They're not all comedy people, but they are sort of loyal and they know me very well because of the type of uh, show I do. But yeah, so that you know that certainly is different now. I do I am able to sell out uh, small theaters in some markets, and I do have a bigger following than I did. Well, our culture is so niche oriented now that you know you don't need 30 million people to listen to your podcast. You can. If 10,000 people listen to your podcast, which is not a hard number to achieve, then 10,000 people listen to your podcast, you know? And then that, you can do something with that, and you can build a community, and you can, you can literally change the world just recording. Can you get rich as a podcaster? No. no. God, no. You can't. I mean, you can do something where you have, like, the Nerdist or, uh, 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 or uh, Earwolf, what have you, where they have a bunch of different ones and they've got money coming in. I don't know if you can get rich, but I know as an individual person doing a podcast, no, you don't get even remotely rich. Not something that you could do for money. You're doing That's right. <laughs> I'm doing it for fun, yes. I make some money, but minimal, believe me. I've been listening to podcasts forever, basically since they first started, I think 2005, and uh, I never thought my audience would really enjoy them. I just kind of wanted to do it for myself. And they shockingly really love them, and I'm really excited. I hope I get to do it forever. All in all, it's my life completely. So, now your audience may just be your students, so I wanted to jump in here and just briefly talk about some scenarios, which you could probably already imagine. Uh, a student uh, has a doctor's appointment or they had to miss a class for one reason or another. So they subscribe to the class podcast. Um, at our university, we do, uh, we record all the lectures, and well, not all of them, but most lecture, lecture halls. And students can subscribe to the, either an audio podcast or video. And like audio is probably more popular because then the students can listen to it you know, while they're commuting um, and, and coming into school. So, um, and, and this, this slide just talks about some of the le lecture capture uh, technologies out there that we use. Uh, Echo 360 is used at Jefferson now. Uh, we use MediaSite and Panopto, and there's also Integrity Campus. All of these lecture capture technologies uh, have a way to uh, allow the students to, uh, to listen uh, through subscribing to a podcast. So it makes your job easy. Uh, if, if, if you didn't know that, that was capa uh, you, you had that capability, you know, talk to your um, IT folks, um, your AV folks, and, and see if your lecture is already being captured. Uh, you may want to point that out to your students because they may not know. I, I'm surprised that you know, these students that we think are so tech savvy, they don't always know uh, how to use the technology. Um, here's a screenshot from a long time ago. This is a Presso classroom, which is now uh, Echo 360. Uh, I teach pharmacokinetics, and um, uh, they can play it on the website. I don't think they had a way, and this goes back a few years, they didn't have a way to actually um, link to a podcast. Now, here is the um, Echo 360 Now. This is, I, I give the same lectures at the School of Osteopathic Medicine in New Jersey, and you can see down here there's a link to an audio file and a video file. So they can subscribe to the audio file and the video file by clicking on these links. My name is Rod Murray, currently executive director of Academic. Okay, I'm going to skip that. So here's the, the idea in terms of, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, that, if it's an hour and I, I, give, I give three hours, I'm not going to edit it. Yeah, so the, the students, uh, if they miss class, I can't imagine anybody listening to it except maybe uh, if they miss class or uh, before the exam. You know, the great part about it, and I should have pointed this out, uh, I might have a screenshot of that. The students love it because they can play it back double speed. So they can get to the meat of it, they can skip right to the meat of it that they want to hear, and then if they want, they can play at double speed. So uh, I guess here's the ultimate thing, to put your content out there and, and have it available as many ways as possible for your students. Uh, this is just a, another screenshot of another possible scenario. Again, um, uh, since I was at medical school, uh, certainly it's important uh, uh, um, continuing medical education. It's perfect for continuing ed. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, physicians and other uh, professions uh, subscribe to podcasts to keep, uh, keep up with their latest uh, uh, technologies. Uh, this, this, is, this case scenario is uh, a patient. I actually knew a doctor, actually graduated from Jefferson, but uh, I didn't discover until later. He was a cardiovascular surgeon at the University of uh, uh, Arizona. And he, was, he got a lot of press because he took away all the magazines out of his uh, waiting room and he gave them all video iPods and all about the different procedures. So the patients liked it, he liked it because most of the questions are answered by the patients sitting there in the room and he would even lend them out to his patients and, and, and then they have much better idea what they're going to go through, what the post-operative procedures, uh, you know, the issues were and that way they could come back with much more focused uh, questions. So uh, there are three scenarios there that, that um, help you understand the the benefits of teaching and learning. And here I sort of outlined some of them. Um, students can learn on the move. They can remove the, review the material often. Um, with our media site system, we can see, if you look at an hour lecture recording, you can see what part in the lecture the students are playing and how much time they spend there. So you can, you can see if there's a difficult period, uh, you know, some complex information that students listen to over and over again. They can play back twice the time. And this also enables you to flip the classroom. I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about that. Um, if you have uh, pre-recorded lectures, or better yet, small, bite-sized chunks of content, and that's what I would suggest, 10, 15 minutes that a student can listen to while they're preparing dinner or whatever, uh, have them listen to it before class, and then spend your class on doing more activities. So there's another mechanism you can use to help flip the classroom. Um, People, sometimes people ask me, what's the difference between streaming and podcasting? Well, the beauty of this is that you don't have, a, have to have a live internet connection. If it's already downloaded to your device, you don't have to worry about your, uh, your data plan. You don't have to worry about being on Wi-Fi. You can just listen to your podcast. Podcast is growing, and, and I'm, uh, I'm going to show you how to get to this res uh, res uh, some of these resources because I want to give you some more time to ask questions. Um, so all this will be available uh, for you to, to look at. Um, 50 educational podcasts you should check out. Um, a podcast gallery is a nice, more, more of the popular kinds of podcasts, not necessarily um, uh, educational, but uh, I mean, they're educational for you, but maybe not your students. Freakonomics Radio, I used to like to listen to. Uh, a lot of the NPR programs are on there. Um, and then uh, Huffington Post had a list of the best podcasts you should be listening to in 2013. So. Uh, if you want to know the scholarly uh, um, activity around podcasting, here's a little a bibliography for you. I mean, um, not every study shows that it's, it's great, um, but most of them show that the, the students like it and the students get something out of it for, uh, for learning. And here are some of the uh, actual URLs to a lot of the different things I talked about in my, in my talk today. So with that, I'm going to stop and... Uh, answer any questions you might have.